going to super briefly introduce um, uh, our speakers and the star of tonight's film, Emmy Award winning actor Joe Morton. Um, he is, as you know, a, a, a film, a television, a stage veteran, best known for his iconic Hollywood roles in Scandal and Terminator 2, Judgment Day, and Speed 2, but he's also a pro in the musical Hair, um, which was followed by a Tony Award and a Theater World nominated starring role in Lorraine Hansberry Raving the Sun. So that's pretty exciting. And then he's going to be in conversation with our own Smaran Dayal, who's a PhD candidate in comparative literature at NYU, where he happens to be writing a dissertation on literary Afrofuturism. And I all thank you. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we've uh, only ever uh, recently used this room for other things like uh, uh, having a school class over that we were working with, but it's an incredible honor and extremely exciting to have uh, Joe Morton here uh, before we screen uh, the, w the wonderful film, The Brother from Another Planet. Um, so this uh, event is part of the museum's um, uh, Black History Month programming. And um, it's also sort of synced up, tied in with um, uh, the Carnegie, Carnegie Hall's Afrofuturism Festival. Um, so, Joe, if I may, um, this, this is something that uh, you know, we uh, started talking about, but the movie came out 40 years ago, right. um, almost. And it's, it's uh, 2022 now, and you have uh, people in their 20s and 30s, like me, who weren't bo born when this film came out, <laughs> who were watching. That makes me feel really good. <laughs> <laughs> but we're huge fans, right? We're, we're watching the movie now and we're appreciating it, but how do you feel about this, uh, about this gap and what do you think the film's relevance still is for today? I mean, I think what's great that now there a younger generation is watching the films is a real testament to artistry that if you make something that has some artistic, wonderful artistic qualities to it, it will stand the test of time. People will watch it over and over and over again. They will pass it down from one generation to the next. Um, relevancy to today's world, you know, John Sayles is a social commentarian. So what we talk about in Brother of Another Planet are essentially two things. One is uh, obviously this fellow is escaping from slavery. So that's something that we have talked about, especially during this part of the year all the time. The second is about the number of black people who have talents and no place to challenge those talents. No place to channel, I should say, those talents. And that's an another big part of the film. A, a third part of the film is, of, of course, the relationship between young black men and white policemen, um, which we have been talking about now for the last couple of years, uh, several years in fact. So this is 1984 in 2022. Unfortunately, m many of these things are things that we are still dealing with. Um, so two things that I really wanted to ask you about was um, first, the the immense sort of uh, acting craft that it takes to portray a role that has no dialogues, right? So I'd love to hear, hear about that from you. But then secondly, also, um, we're here in the Museum of the City of New York, and one of the things that we do is track the changes in New York City over the years. So if, if how do you see the differences between Harlem and New York in the 1980s and today? Um, and and what is the what is the film? Um, you know, how does the film help us think about this? Well, on, on, on one level, there is, as you'll see, a scene in the film where Fisher Stevens um, does a car trick on the on the train, um, and they say, at the end of the car trick, he says, "Now, if you want to see a real magic trick, watch what happens." And they arrive at 96th Street, and all the white people get off the train. <laughs> <laughs> That's no longer true. <laughs> 
Um, Harlem in those days obviously was kind of the, if you will, um, darker toe of the island of Manhattan. It was sort of looked at as where crime took place, where drugs took place, all those kinds of things. Harlem today, um, whether we enjoy this fact or not, is far more gentrified, far more kind of looking at it, we look at it from a perspective of history. You know, anyone who lives on 137th Street knows that now that's, that's a place of history. Um, uh, anything that goes on in Harlem now has a great deal more substance and quality to it, given by everybody who goes up there to visit. Um, in terms of the character, um, you know, it's, for me, it was, it's an actor's playground. I mean, somebody says, I want you to play a character in a feature full-length movie, and you don't get a chance to speak a word, and you have to convey everything through your body. I mean, what better challenge for any actor? So I was in heaven. And, and basically, John and I, I mean, um, I'd only known John kind of socially. This was his third film. Um, and so when sort of the casting went out, when the breakdowns went out, the, it was said that th what John was looking for was a kind of Buster Keaton kind of character who had a rubber face. When I read the script, I thought, nah, that doesn't make any sense to me. It seems like it's something else. John and I had an interview together. We talked for about 45 minutes. Um, I told him some things about my life, mostly that I had been living outside of the country for a very long time, um, was a army brat, um, was always considered myself kind of the stranger, if you will, no matter where I was. Left the interview. Um, John didn't, I, th I kind of expected we would do some improvs, he would do something since the character didn't speak. Um, he didn't do any of that, so when I left I thought, well, I guess I didn't get that job. Um, and he called me later that night to say, and yes, in fact, I did. And one of the reasons he said he hired me was he felt as if I had enough experience at that point to take care of my own emotional life within the film, and that's what he needed, someone who could find their way emotionally through the film with that, because John was a very young director, and I don't mean necessarily chronolo chronologically young, that was his third film. So he was still kind of finding his way as a director, and he needed actors that he could really trust, and fortunately I turned out to be one of those. So the this event and what's happening at Carnegie Hall at the moment is all organized under the term Afrofuturism, right? But the term only gets coined in the 90s by the cultural critic Mark Derry. In a, in a really substantive way, it seemed to me like th this film predates that term and anticipates it. Um, but there's something about uh, the futurism and Afrofuturism that might not be reflected here. So I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about the relation between the brother from another planet and Afrofuturism. Yeah, I, you know, John was, as I said, a social commentarian. So I don't know that he was thinking, certainly the term didn't exist, I don't know that he was thinking about Afrofuturism so much as he was thinking about what was going on in 1984 uh, in terms of slavery and what was going on in terms of relationship between folks who lived in Harlem and the white folks who did not live in Harlem. I mean, to invent the brother from another planet was a way to give an audience who knew nothing about black culture and nothing about Harlem a, a way inside through the, through the eyes of someone who also knew nothing about that particular culture. Um, so it wasn't so much about thinking about the future, it really was thinking about the present and talking about things like, you know, the brother sees uh, a black man being arrested and he's spread eagle on a car and he looks at a pawn shop and sees um, a, a, cruci a crucifix with Jesus spread eagled on the crucifix and thinks, oh my God, that's what they do to us here. Um, so it's things like that, that were being, that's being discussed in the film, not so much the future really to say, well, only the future in terms of we need to take care of these things before they get worse. Um, you started talking about the kind of political critique that the film stages, all right, um, uh, with the, the, the scene with the man being arrested. Um, there's, there's two moments in the film that really struck me. One is, um, I mean, one is the fact that the two pursuers of the brother are these uh, uh, white aliens, right, and that we're trying to figure out. Um, and the second thing that, that really struck me is in that particular scene that you mentioned, um, the brother knows that the police are a danger before he even um, uh, 
knows what anything on earth is. He's still figuring out what money is, what uh, people are doing. I believe it's on 125th Street um, in a shop, how, how um, society works. But the moment he sees the badge, he recognizes it as a danger. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear more about um, you know, what kind of the, the political uh, message of the, f the film is, according to you. Uh, yeah, so two things. One, uh, in terms of recognizing the authority figure, he sees the badge and he sees the gun. And he recognizes those two things as white authority against black people. Because we have to remember that he is whatever he called himself, but he is an escaped slave from wherever he came from. So that was something for him to quickly recognize. Story about the two gentlemen who chase him, which are played by John Sayles and David Strathairn. Um, John was off to do yet another film before Brother of Another Planet. He was going to do Mate One. And on the way to the plane, it turned out that the money dropped out. So Mate One was not going to happen. Now, despite the fact that John is an insomniac, um, which is probably why he's so prolific, he actually did fall asleep at some point and had two dreams. <laughs> the first dream was a black man in Harlem who clearly knew nothing about Harlem or New York or anything about this planet. The second dream was a title card that had old-fashioned sci-fi lettering on it, you know, big block letters with all the shadows on it, and it said, assholes from space. <laughs> Those were the two guys who were chasing the brother in the film. <laughs> Ten days later, John finished writing Brother from Another Planet. That's, that's, uh, that's quite something. There's um, one more thing that I want to focus on, which is, the brother has special powers, right? He can repair machines and he can heal people. So he has these sort of, you know, extraterrestrial powers, but we never see him using them towards violence or, uh, uh, you know, to harm others, but, but in a sense to, to heal and repair. Um, except for once. Except for once. What, what is that once? Uh, that's when he discovers who the, who the drug pin is. He finds him in his house, confronts him with the drugs, and actually kills him with the, with the drugs uh, right before the end of the film. Um, I hope that's not a spoiler for those of you who haven't seen the film. Um, so, so the idea, again, was that John felt that there were lots of black people in this country, in this world, who have tremendous talents and no place to channel those talents. I mean, at, at, w at one point, you know, the brother's doing all kinds of things just to make <coughs> money, and he has these abilities. He can heal by touch, and he can, he can repair by touch, um, which I just thought was a, a wonderful uh, metaphor for someone who actually has something to contribute to society as a whole, but the society that he lives in disallows that from happening. So uh, a last couple of questions I want to ask you is how this f film figures in your career. What place did it have for you in, in your development as an actor and the sort of trajectory that your career was taking? And, and how do you think about it now, like in 2022? Brother from Another Planet will always remain my most favorite film. One, it's the first film where I had a lead in, in a major feature film. But it wasn't a major feature film, actually. It was an independent film. But independent films in those days was a big deal. I mean, it was basically Spike Lee and John Sayles were the ones out in front. Um, in terms of trajectory, it's an interesting thing. After Brother came out, you know, the reviews for the most part were pretty good. Um, although I remember one reviewer said, you know, I wish that John Sayles would leave his homegrown movies in Jersey. Um, <laughs> and whenever I went to, um, now remember, I don't speak in this film. You never hear me say a single word, not utter a sound. And so when I would go to auditions, people had really no idea what to expect. And when they heard this particular voice, they thought, oh, um, and then they would say things to me like, you know, I really loved Brother from Another Planet, which meant I was not going to get that job. <laughs> Eventually, you know, things changed because things like Brother from Another Planet, things like doing Raisin, which was a musical version of Raisin in the Sun, sort of made me visible for other kinds of things. Um, and so it all developed in a very different way. But I have to thank, I mean, I did three films with John. Uh, this film, uh, Lone Star um, and um, City of Hope. Um, and so I have to thank him for being one of the supporters of my career. 
One thing that maybe uh, not a lot of people know is that you also narrate audiobooks. Yes. Um, and I'm a personal fan of, of uh, a lot of your narrations. But um, could you maybe, uh, to conclude, tell us something about your current projects and future projects? Because I'm sure a lot of people here are following your career and are fans of, of you. And so we'd love to know what, what you're working on now and what you're going to be working on. Uh, in terms of audiobooks, the last audiobook I did was um, Water Dancer, uh, Tanashi Coates' book. If you haven't heard it or read it, you should. It's absolutely beautiful and brilliant. Um, I'm doing two shows at this point. One is Our Kind of People for Fox, which is based on a documentary. Thank you, a documentary book of the same title about black elite. It is about um, a family that has had generational wealth for three generations. Um, something that is unusual for television, usually uh, if it's a black show and it's generational and anything, it's usually generational poverty. In this case, it's generational wealth. Uh, most recently, um, as of February 17th, um, I am a, a producer and co-host for a brand new show that will uh, that's on Crackle. Uh, Crackle, for those of you who don't know, is a streaming platform. It's free. Um, and the name of the show is Inside the Black Box, which is essentially inside the actor's studio, but from a black point of view. And the idea of the series is that we bring on celebrities who are their actors and directors and even casting directors. We bring on Kim Williams, who is the uh, vice president of casting at Disney, um, to talk about not their new project, but to talk about their experience in this business as people of color. And they're talking about this not just to myself and the co-host who is Tracy Moore, who is a celebrity coach and casting director, but they're talking to 45 to 60 students that are on camera. Um, and we do improvise, we do improvisations with those students. Very beginning of the show, we'll do an improv uh, where they pull a, a, a prop out of a, literally, a black box and have to spend two minutes um, using that, that prop. And then later in the show, after we've talked to the guest and they've heard what this particular guest had to say in terms of their experience in this business, um, they will do an improv with the guest. Um, so what this provides is on-camera opportunities for these young, aspiring actors um, amongst each other with the guests that we bring on. They are educated in terms of what paths they should or should not follow, given whatever this guest had to say in terms of their, that particular guest's goals and obstacles that they over, had to overcome. And it's entertaining all at the same time. Um, just recently, I found out that a couple of our students uh, have been pursued by agents. One guy named Alfonso has gotten a job on Broadway. Um, another casting agent has called and said she wants a list of all of our students uh, for a new show that she's casting. So we are, what the show has done and will hopefully continue to do is not only give you stories about what this business is about from kind of a behind the scenes point of view, but give an opportunity to young aspiring artists. Well, Joe, it was an, a genuine honor to meet you, and we're so grateful to have you here this evening. Um, if we could all uh, thank him for, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the film. <laughs>